to the world. Subscribe now to the Hot 97 YouTube channel. It's Ebro in the morning with Laura Styles and Rosenberg. Listen, you better know his name, but if you don't know his name, I guarantee you, you know his face. It's Ebro, Facts. Lauren Rosenberg with an amazing guest today. Give it up for John Carlo Esposito. What's up, man? Hey. How are you? <laughs> Good to see you this morning. Happy to be here. Listen, uh, a, a guy who grew up in New York since about six years old. I mean, you, I, I, I guess we, we're going to have to start with the Spike Lee relationship and we'll get to that. Um, but I just wanted to to know, you know, as an actor, um, do is it common outside of the acting world that people know you as John Carlo? Or do people mostly come up to you and call you by the character names? So many names that you've played. Big brother on my team. <laughs> you know, uh, it is an interesting life that I have. I have a bifurcated personality because most people call me by my character name. Got it. And I, how does that make you feel as an actor? You know, it makes me feel good uh, because I like to disappear into my roles. And I feel like I played so many wonderful characters. And if you want to start with Spike Lee, you know, when you think about Big Brother Almighty Julian uh, from school right. days or... Um, bugging out from Do the Right Thing, uh, who has become a, an iconic character, it makes me proud and it makes me very happy because it makes allows me to know that I've done my job well. Can is you it, tell is us? It, oh, go ahead, Laura, I'm sorry. Well, can you tell us about uh, how you, you and Spike first met? I was doing a play at the Negro Ensemble Company called Zoo Man and the Sun, and Spike uh, came to see the play, and I got a message after the play was over, and I was cooling off in my dressing room that there was a young gentleman outside who wanted to come and speak to me. And uh, and he came backstage and we were in the dressing room for over an hour talking about some of his aspirations for film. At that time, he was cutting films uh, at Maxie Cohen's place down in the village. Mm. You know, he'd wear those white gloves and run the film through the steam deck. Right. And uh, wow. I loved his ideas and I sent me a script. And what impressed me uh, the most was that he wrote all of his scripts by hand. And mm. I felt like, wow, this cat is putting his spirit right onto the page. Uh, so I've, I've enjoyed all of my collaborations with Spike, and he certainly changed the nature of black film in a world where we didn't see positive images of ourselves or any images of ourselves at that period of time. Just picking up from the conversation of people recognizing you for a character, um, has that most become Gus from Breaking Bad? And also... Did you did you all of a sudden start meeting all these people who saw you on Breaking Bad and didn't realize how many times you'd been in their life prior to that? Such a great question. You know, many people don't really realize that they've seen me before. They know I look familiar. Uh, I was at a coffee shop yesterday uh, working on uh, rehearsing some work that I have for this week. And uh, a, a woman very politely, when I went to the restroom, I was working with a coach, a dialect coach. Uh, handed her a note that was written on um, the cover of the, 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 the coffee so you didn't burn yourself, you know, one of those covers. And mm -hmm. she wrote a lovely note. And it was really um, interesting to me because she was uh, Caucasian, about 35 years old. And she said, keep on kicking butt, big brother almighty. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I was a little shocked. But, uh, you know, to, to directly answer your question even a little further, uh, you know, uh, people do have that reaction. They go, oh, and they when I start speaking to them, oh, but you're Moff Gideon uh, from Star Wars. Certainly right. the, the things that I do that are more current, that are happening right now, um, people recognize me from right away. And then they sort of put together when they hear my voice and me talk to them and uh, see my demonstrative attitude, they go, wait a minute, weren't you bugging out? You know, so <laughs> it, it also depends on um, where I am in the world, what neighborhood I'm in. Right. Um, could be uh, an indicator as to people knowing me for certain and different kinds of roles. But certainly, you know, Gustavo Fring is another iconic character. I mean, I feel like I've been blessed to be on the 100 best of all time films list, you know, for The Usual Suspects, for Do the Right <sighs> Thing. Both of those are on the list. And then to, to come into this age where our young people who may not know me from some of those films are so into breaking bad and and now better mandalorian, call mandalorian better call saul and now godfather of harlem um listen godfather of harlem i think rosenberg you just got started mm -hmm. 
Um, I'm up to the time, but I have not watched the newest episode. Um, the the idea of New York City, where you grew up mostly, yeah, after movie, your parents are from Denmark. Your mom is black uh, and met your father in Denmark, I, I read, and then you moved to New York City around the age of six, correct? That's right. My father's Italian from Naples, Italy, and uh, my mother is from Alabama, was a performer and opera singer, and they met in an opera house in, in Italy. Uh, and she had a very strong relationship with Harlem. Uh, you know, she used to work at Tomford Soda Fountain. That was on 125th Street. She used to go down to Sidney Poitier's place where he'd do plays on Broadway and come back and be in the kitchen cooking for folks. And so she had a very strong relationship and took me to Abyssinian Baptist Church when mm. I was about 14 years old. And I got a chance to hear um, the wonderful sermon of Adam Clayton Powell Jr., who I play in Godfather of Harlem in its second season on ethics. Well, and that's what I was just going to go to. How much of your character of Adam Clayton Powell is from personal experience and well, like what you're pulling from? You know, uh, what I'm pulling from is is certainly the memory of meeting him and and hearing him preach at the church. Uh, but then there, historically, there's so much to this man. And I'm so blessed to play him. And which is one of the reasons I love to play historical characters, because it allows you another route in even if you've had a firsthand experience, and I'm blessed to have had that, uh, to feel and remember his essence from the eyes of a child um, or a young man, but to go into his history and do the research and understand the 866 bills that he passed in Congress, to understand and really realize why um, Bill Clinton took an office on 125th Street, uh, honoring the African-American community, but also uh, honoring uh, Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Boulevard. I mean, this cat was the first um, civil rights leader in our history uh, at that time to really have a national voice. Right. And he had that voice because he had a congregation of over five, 6,000 people at the City and Baptist Church. So he was the first to realize that the church was certainly uh, the pulpit was a jumping off place to be able to affect the numbers in the voters uh, in the voters box. One well, and and definitely the way the writing of Godfather of Harlem even I think articulates very well if people don't understand the dynamic of I think it was Kennedy at the time uh needing Adam Clayton Powell um to um know what's going on in the black community uh but also the black community being able to directly hold a presidential candidate or an, an elected president accountable and other electeds accountable by using that community power source. That's correct. Uh, and a very powerful moment in time because Kennedy and Powell were very close and it certainly was a negotiation uh, on Powell, Powell's part. But when they realized that he was in control of so many people or you know, he really affected their vote, um, it was important to have Powell in your pocket, but you couldn't get Powell in your pocket. This is the thing, the man had a storied life. Um, he loved jazz music. Uh, he uh, was also um, someone who loved to have fun and had a light spirit, but he was well-educated and a lawyer. So he didn't give things up easily. And so it wasn't as if uh, you were back in time in, in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. I mean, he certainly started stumping in the 40s. He wanted to do right by his people. And this was a very, he had a great, a very high integrity. So Kennedy knew he had to deliver uh, things that Powell was asking for. And it got even more serious with Lyndon Baines Johnson afterwards, uh, who also got very tight with Powell. In fact, they played golf together and, and went hunting together and drank together. And, uh, but he wasn't, Powell wasn't giving up an inch because he really believed uh, that black people um, were equal to white people. And he lived his life that way, which is why the Southern Dixiecrats hated him. Right. Um, he felt uh, equal in his heart and soul. And he then exemplified that to his people. Yeah. We call those Southern Dixiecrats now racist Democrats. <laughs> That's right. Just That's clean exactly. straight up and down. Uh, uh, go ahead, Rosenberg. I just wanted I, I, if, I was going to move away from Adam Clayton Powell, bro. So if you want to stay. Yeah, nah, no, no, no. Go ahead. So I, I wanted to go to you, Giancarlo. When I saw your when I realized your full name is Giancarlo Esposito. And I thought about the character bugging out and do the right thing. And how much that is a, a film about ultimately the complex relationships between 
different ethnic minorities in New York, particularly Italians and black people in New York. And you, your name's clearly Italian and you're a black man living in New York. Take me through what the emotional journey was making that film and sort of the complexities of all the characters, you know, from Sal to Mookie and everyone in between. Well, it was a very interesting film for me to make because, of course, uh, both of the, the background of being a black man uh, in America at, at that time, you know, 1989, um, was a turning point. And uh, for me to also be proud of my Italian heritage is something that's always been close to me. So the mm -hmm. film for me um, was uh, a revelation in many ways, uh, specifically and especially with, uh, uh, with uh, in the scenes with the character of Sal. Um, I felt like Danny Aiello had grown up on the streets of New York as well. Now, when you start to think about the history, uh, who built what first, you know, the Italians, yeah, the Irish were here, the Italians were here, but who was here way before them? That's that right. This country, it was African-American men and women. Um, we are the ones, and it was the sweat of our brow that, uh, and for no remuneration, uh, that built the country. So when you start to feel like who has a claim and bugging out was staking a claim. He was, I want to remind you, um, who was here first and who did the work of creating this infrastructure, who did the free labor of creating this country. So he was carrying um, all of that weight uh, because he had just learned all of this information and was proud of it and wanted to, you know, to, to say it, shout it from the rooftops. So for me, it was a very emotional experience because here we have both parts of me wanting to be um, vulnerable to the message of the film but to have people understand um, the emotional and the intellectual connection and the spiritual connection, because African-American people built this country with an underlying spirituality that one day they're going to be free. One day we will be free. One day we will be, we will be um, rewarded for our effort. And that, to me, is so very clearly stated by Spike, 40 acres and a mule which was given then rescinded um, very quickly and did never happen. So those reparations are still trying to happen, which would allow people to feel like they're part of a society that their people built, that their ancestry built. So for me, man, don't get me going. It was emotional, it was passionate. You know, I felt like I had to be the channel for all of that. And I had to pick a side, you know? Spike would look at me and say, pick a side. What are you gonna do if there's a revolution? What side are you gonna be on? And I said, well, that's a difficult question for me. But he was, he was cultivating and massaging my thinking so that I could be fully embodied in the role of bugging out. And I picked a side and went for it. Because well, because bugging out, it, when you think about it, bugging out really set off the whole end of the film. I mean, everything that happens there with Radio Ahim, you could argue is, is sort of because of bugging out at the end of the film. No doubt about it. Uh, you know, Bugging Out wanted to be acknowledged, and he brings up some very simple points. How come you got no brothers on the wall? You know, <laughs> you're the black community. You said repeats to us. What's up? Give us, give us some love. You know, and so to me, this movie was the real turning point for people to, you know, to pardon the pun, wake up and understand. Um, and not only uh, people, Italian American but also African-Americans to give them and empower them, give them the feeling that they deserve, they belong, and, and they should not be embarrassed to stand up, talk about their history and their ancestry, and hold people's feet to the fire to be able to give them some props. Well, and simultaneously, you're living in New York making this film. And in the streets of New York, when this film is coming out, you know, the passions and the incidents that are taking place that are racial are bubbling over. Um, that how, summer is Central Park Five. Same yeah, that summer, summer the movie is, comes out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did at the time, do you, I'm sure in, I don't know, was it in the moment that you realized like this film is super important or was it retros retrospectively that you were like, what was going on in, in, in you and the cast and everybody working on the film? I would love to know, like looking around. What were you guys feeling and seeing? This is a fascinating question because we made the movie uh, in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, uh, and we took over a whole block um, that was crack infested and um, uh, you know just criminally oriented. And I think there were we left 
the, the fruit of Islam, nation of Islam went in and cleaned it up. And uh, there were two families left living on the block. So firstly, we felt like we were living it. We felt like we were on a movie set uh, in Hollywood, but we were on the streets of Brooklyn. And so it was the real deal. And while we were making it, we started to feel like there was a synchronicity, not only through Spike's energy and direction, and of course, his wonderful writing, but also um, through the feeling that we all had connected to the material. And at that time, Tawana Brawley was a big deal. And, yep. and Spike was close to Al Sharpton. Al Sharpton visited the set. Uh, and so we had you know, some real political struggle and it was hot. So when it's hot, you know, when you're feeling uncomfortable, you know, tensions rise as well. So there's so many political comments being made within the movie, not only through Sal's restaurant, but also through the Koreans who were on the corner in the neighborhood. The corner men were making comments about how they do their business. Um, so all of these things affected us and all, I would say maybe two weeks into the movie, everyone started to feel like we were a part of something that was bigger than ourselves. And then we started to feel an energetic sensitivity that the creative part of this film was going to make waves. And by the time we were close to the end of the film, we all knew that this movie was going to bust the door open. We could feel it. And, well, and a month feeling, after it dropped, you, Yusef Hawkins killing happened. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Um, precisely right. Yusef Hawkins happened right after that. And it, it allowed many of us to feel like we had to connect. And this is Spike's, the genius of Spike. And he doesn't differentiate his artistic work and comment um, between what his selfless service work is. And I think it was a great example for all of us on the film to speak out, to understand that we are instruments um, uh, of our creativity and that there's no divide between that. And that if you are fully in service, then you would use that to be able to have the world recognize, wake up, and start to change what is still entrenched uh, in our system, is the systematic racism with which we've all grown up with and still are privy to. Um, so you get the, uh, the ask or the script, I don't know what the process was for Godfather of Harlem. You are the beloved character bugging out from do the right thing. Now here we are know, 40 years later, Mm. And you're in The Godfather of Harlem playing Adam Clayton Powell, which also delves right into the black Italian uh, relationship and, yeah. you know, everything going on in Harlem at this time. Uh, interracial relationships. I mean, you know, uh, corrupt policing, all of it. Um, did you see the script? And it was a no brainer. Boom. I need to do this. This touches right at home for me. Well, I got a call from Chris Brancato, who um, I really love the subject matter that he gets involved in, in the television space. And he's quite brilliant in his collaborations. Uh, so he gave me a call, assuming um, that I wasn't available. And we had met years ago and he had inquired about me. We had a wonderful lunch about doing Narcos. And, but he did make the call. And I said, Chris, you know, um, this particular time in history is equally as important for um, people to know about and what the struggle was in the 60s. And I'd love to be a part of it. And it turns out um, I can make space. Uh, I am available. So we called the head of the network and, uh, and uh, they were terribly excited. Uh, well, I guess I should take it back. Chris was on the phone with the head of the network and they said, who are you gonna get? They're talking about cast lists. And who are you gonna get for Adam Clayton Powell? And, uh, and he said, you know, I don't know. And the network uh, chief head, uh, Michael said, you know, there's this actor, Giancarlo Esposito. I think he should play Powell. And, and Chris went, I love him, but he's not available. So I made myself available. And then Chris walked me through what, how the setup of the show, that mm -hmm. every year would, um, every season would be a different year. And I thought, well, that's a brilliant construct that we, we would get, work our way through history. But I, I was, you know, obviously asked the question, this is not going to be a history lesson. This right. is going to be a dramatic show. So when he mentioned Forrest Whitaker, who I, I absolutely admire uh, and adore and have worked with a number of times, uh, he's a very powerful actor who also is 
takes from the Spike Lee school in that he does it for himself. So he was producing the piece and he was slated to play Bumpy Ellsworth Johnson. And then I got really excited because Bumpy Johnson, uh, people think of, you know, as the godfather, but as a criminal. And to, uh, to ex uncover and allow people to know not only what the history was at the time, but also to know that Bumpy Ellsworth Johnson made a decision about helping his community um, through what he had to do. And he's torn because he's selling that doogee, you know, he's selling heroin. And so then you have the opportunity to really get into personal relationships like interracial relationship, uh, the conflict between Italians and blacks because there all there has been a conflict there. And I think it's because Italians and African-Americans are very much alike in many ways. And I, mm -hmm. and I, I know that our, I, I look into the problems of our world today being connected to tribalism, you know, and, and, and so, that is something that we, we, we roll in clans, we roll in tribes. Well, black people do and so do Italians. So um, after reading the first script, I was sold because the history was correct, but sometimes a little bit bent to be able to service the relationships of the show. And the one thing that put this show over the top is the fact that they bring in a contemporary feeling uh, with Swizz Beats' music. Oh, the music is incredible. So good. incredible. And, and it allows you to step into something that has the rhythmic beat of the time, right? of the now. And then it allows you, if you look at the whole piece, politically it's correct, Morgenthau, Johnson, Kennedy, Powell, Malcolm X, so beautifully played by Nigel Thatch, um, uh, uh, Gigante, you know, Vincent D'Onofrio, uh, Chaz Palminteri, all these are real characters who live in, and the struggle um, was within first because the police were controlled by the government and the Italians had a stranglehold on Harlem in regard to um, dope and in regard to prostitution. And these were money makers, big money makers. So Bumpy wanted mm -hmm. to take that over and handle that so the remuneration from that could be um, shared with his own people. Although it brings, the show is a perfect um, platform to bring in the moral aspect uh, and characterization of, of the time. And it embellishes and looks at things in a straightaway fashion. Well, and, and there's a, I don't know what episode it is in the first season, uh, but there's a scene where it's, uh, I think you guys are getting your shoes shine and it's bumpy Adam Clayton Powell and Malcolm X debating the kind of direction and and prioritization of what needs to be going on in the neighborhood and who's doing what the right way and who's messing things up and malcolm's chiming in like y'all supposed to be doing this and you know adam clayton powell and malcolm have this back and forth that goes on through the first season um scenes like that you know clearly we weren't there we don't know if that actually happened but we would like to believe it did historically uh Adam Clayton Powell respected Malcolm X, but did not agree with his politics right. and the way he was guiding his people. Uh, but, and it's a wonderful example of, of, of African-Americans being able to, because we sometimes look at our relationships as crabs in a basket. And you could relate that to today uh, because everyone's out for himself. Uh, you know, every man for himself, Adam Clayton Powell, um, respected Malcolm and Malcolm respected Adam, but they had to agree to disagree. That's right. And that's a difficult thing to agree to disagree, but we're working for the same thing. The problem with the relationship between Malcolm, Bumpy and Powell was that um, Powell would not do anything against the law. Powell wanted to operate within the letter of the law so he could change the system. Um, I don't know if people know, but Adam Clayton Powell um, was the first writer of the Civil Rights Act. He was the main writer of it, not invited to the signing because Lyndon Baines Johnson, as he said, I gotta throw that mouth, I gotta throw Martin Luther King a bone. Uh, and Martin Luther King and Adam Clayton Powell um, weren't the best of friends. They actually stole from each other. Uh, I can read sermons by King and go, wait, that sounds familiar. Powell said that first. I can read sermons by by uh, by Adam Clayton Powell and go, wait a minute, I think I heard Martin say that. So mm -hmm. at a time, people were divided just like today. Mm -hmm. And somebody had to bring them together. And in our show, Bumpy starts to speak and talk reason into both Malcolm X and Powell. However, Malcolm also 
did not want to go. He wanted to do it by in a certain protest way, but he wanted to do it a certain way as well. So you had people trying to figure out how to come together to change the world at that time and the situation for black people in Harlem. That's a great scene uh, at the shoe shine um, well, stand uh, because it allows us to know where business gets done. You know, right. it gets done in the back rooms. Well, and I the think the most shop. powerful thing too was just the, you know, the, you know, people outside the black community always like to think that all black people think the same, moving the same, or there's a there's a singular spokesperson for uh, the black movement, as it were, or the community. Um, and it's always like, nah, we're not we're we're not a monolith. We're much more dynamic than that. And I think you know, seeing those power players, those leaders. Those influencers in that scene, just that that's what struck me in that moment was people coming at the same issue from multiple ways. I think that's a, a, a really it's a very astute and wonderful observation because, you know, look, African-Americans, black people, we've been, you know, undermined and demeaned and thought of as being, you know, all the same and stupid and all these things. And and, you know, that gets into the consciousness of people. Uh, over a period of time, and to have uh, you know the contribution that was given by these great men, uh, each in their own way, allows us to to see uh, a different picture of of the desire and intellectual prowess of men who understood. You can understand something on a spiritual level. At, at a level, Adam Clayton Powell was a preacher, and you know he can talk all that God stuff, but he was also a lawyer. So he could implement his ideas and write bills and sway people because he was so very charismatic. The wonderful thing about this role for me is I get to be charismatic. He was, you know, he loved women. He loved drinking. He married Hazel Scott. He was in the jazz clubs. He loved the, the soulful nature of our people. And, and he was one who was able to celebrate that and have fun with that, yet understand that the world wasn't ready for what he uh, was proposing. But he was so very, very committed to changing stuff. So African-American people, just like uh, many other people who have very, um, uh, have their intellects, their poets, their artists, uh, we are a very complicated um, race. But what is wonderful and what the world loves about us and what the world celebrated then and even before that in the 40s was our soulfulness. Mm -hmm. Right. And we could sing and we could dance and we could deliver a soulful feeling that would bring you to tears. Uh, but what people are understanding and have understood since then is that we also have an intellectual quality that allows for incredible ideas, change, incredible infrastructure, architecture, incredible design. So when we start to understand that um, and teach that to our young people, then there's a different kind of pr pride and a different way in which. Um, our people can carry themselves, you know? And, and look, you know, it's not always about um, integrating in a way that we think is going to, what the world has come to now, integrating in a way where everyone is quite the same because any government or any kind of political organization um, that wants to be able to keep people happy wants to control them. Mm -hmm. And we have to understand that, that there is a way for everyone to come together and honor each other without being controlled by a larger entity that is going to then dumb us down and have us all be the same. Whew. What kind of society would that be? Well, it's the one that you see a lot of people rising up and being activated by. Are you, you as somebody that has been in and around film and, you know, obviously seen many of the, the activations of the population against, uh, you know, uh, politics and, you know, uh, the, 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 I'll call it domestic terrorist regimes of the United States. Are you proud about of what you're seeing young people being active right now and, and, and taking up protest and activism? Without a doubt. I feel like this is the only way to remind people that we've all fallen in step. When I look at the black lives matter movement and I look at police brutality that continues, um, to go on, uh, out of hate, sometimes out of fear, uh, it, it breaks my heart, um, but what's more important is for our young people to understand that their voices should and can be heard and that they're connected to the change that's going to be the next wave. 
And it's important for them then to go back and look at shows like Godfather of Harlem to see um, that the struggle never ended. The struggle for humanity is just beginning uh, because it's bigger uh, than what we think. When I look at the policemen and women in uniform, I see um, a large number of African-Americans serving in that way. And they've joined a system and have become, in a way, part of a system that has such systematic racism that without even knowing it, they have a different consciousness. So I feel like it's very, very important to, to teach our young people that not only their voices can be heard, but that it's, it's ingrained. It's even ingrained in us, in me. And I'm African-American, I'm black. Uh, and I have this same feeling of, like the feeling when I went to Africa and I wanted to, to go to Africa with Spike Lee for Malcolm X, and I wasn't able to. I said, Spike, I'll pull cable. You pull cable? I said, I'll be a PA. You be a PA man for me? I was like, yeah. He said, no, I can't take you, man. It's budget, blah, blah, blah. Because I wanted to experience what it was like for um, Africans. And, and since then, I've been to Africa. It's a completely different culture that is not the same as ours. But when That's I went right. to Johannesburg, it was strange to see Black folks talking to, to me who felt subservient, like it was in them. Mm. It was deep ingrained in them. Like it wouldn't look me in the eye sometimes and would be a little bit, this is a few years back, it didn't take up and weren't empowered to be all of who they are. And I mm -hmm. guess that's what I'm speaking about. They felt a little embarrassed. Um, they weren't, didn't have the historical lineage and line of, of being, um, of being expressive in a way that is, that was allowed me to know that they were equal to me. Right. And so it's the same thing in our country for me to keep allowing myself to understand that people I don't know and understand from different continents and different places um, are, are not any different than I am. And they deserve the same love and respect that I do. And they deserve to be empowered as I daily try to empower myself to be honest, truthful, have integrity and be filled with love and gratitude for being able to have the voice that's been given to me. There it is, John Carlo Esposito. We gotta get you back to Africa again, man. You gotta come to Ghana with me, man. I would love you know, that. Ghana's amazing. I hear so, people you know, there are like no place else on the listen, planet. Listen, man. Listen, um, and you know, like uh, many African nations, my team here, you know, they probably exhaust. I talk about all the time. Many African nations, you know, these countries are, you know, 50, 60, 70 years removed just from being, you know, under the colonial rule. So they're getting their footing in many ways, many ways economically, finding their place in the economic space around the world, doing business and things like that, trying to build wealth, build a middle class, figure it out. You know, so is it perfect? Absolutely not. Is there work to be done? Absolutely. But look, uh, you know, America considers itself the one of the greatest nations on planet Earth, and we ain't got shit figured out, you know? So, you know, who are we to look down upon a nation that is, you know, just now, uh, finding out, you know, what it is to do business on the, on the world stage. So, but I definitely get back to, to Africa whenever you can, cause Ghana is an amazing place, amazing people, uh, just the cultural, cultural dynamics, the beaches, like things that you just don't, don't get talked about when you're talking about Africa, right? The beaches, the resorts, the food, you know what I mean? Like, you know, you, you constantly hear about all this negative imagery when you hear about Africa, but uh, definitely, definitely, if you get time, get back there and congrats on everything you've contributed to culture. Um, thank you so much. Um, you know, we, we were just honored to have you today and have a few minutes with you to salute you, celebrate you, hear you talk. And uh, everybody, make sure you go check out The Godfather of Harlem. It's great, man. Really, really fantastic. Thank you, Giancarlo. I'm so appreciative to be here and I, I want to thank you for having me. Uh, always such an intelligent conversation that takes me to a place of contemplation. And uh, and thank you for honoring me in the show. And please get a chance to watch the show. And maybe we'll have a chance to get to Ghana together one day. Thank you, man. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Giancarlo Esposito, ladies and gentlemen.